Now, the last thing we need to talk about before we talk about a complex number, which you're probably like, Miss Long, this whole unit is supposed to be about complex numbers and you keep putting it off. Well, I promise I'm about to tell you what a complex number is. So, you will find out in just a moment, I pinky promise, which is probably the most serious promise. So, let's get going. All right, so in class, you guys brainstorm different categories of real numbers. So, real numbers are any number that occurs in the real world, you can see it, you can plot them on a normal coordinate grid. All right, so real numbers, we break down into several categories of numbers, which have special characteristics. So let's talk about those real quickly, and then we'll talk about complex numbers. Okay, so in a real number is any non-imaginary number. Okay, which real numbers can be broken down into two big categories. You have rational numbers, and irrational numbers. Okay, so an, a rational number is basically what it comes down to, you guys. It's any number that can be represented as a fraction. So if you can represent a number as a fraction, it is a rational number. So a lot of times people talk about what it means as a decimal. Again, if you can represent it as a fraction, that means it's rational, which rational, sorry, fractions obviously turn into decimals, okay? but the easiest way to look at it, in my opinion, is through fractions. Okay, but anyways, if you divide the fraction and you get a terminating decimal, so that means the decimal will stop, or if you get a repeating decimal. So if you get a decimal that keeps going on for forever, so to infinity and beyond with Buzz Lightyear. Buzz Lightyear hangs out at infinity, if you didn't know. Uh, but anyways, if you get a repeating decimal that continues on for forever, but it repeats, so if you get like 0 0.22222, 0 0.3535353, anything that will repeat forever and ever and ever is also going to be a rational number. So these are examples. You have things like negative 2. Negative 2 can be represented as a fraction. Like if you put negative 2 over 1, negative 2 divided by 1 is negative 2. So any number that doesn't look like a fraction is always secretly over one. Okay, so like negative two and one, that's that applies to both of those. You could also have things like one half, seven eighths, or technically zero. Zero over one is still zero. So any of these numbers could be rational. Now the other big category is irrational numbers. So irrational numbers are simply numbers that you cannot represent as a fraction. So if you were to get a decimal, okay, these decimals go on forever. So they're non-terminating and they don't repeat. So examples of these are like constants that you know about that go on for forever and don't repeat as a decimal. So like pi, it's like 3.14, da, 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 da. Probably you know more than that. But pi will keep going on for forever and it never will repeat. Or as far as we know, it doesn't repeat. Um, the square root of 3 and the square root of 5, okay, anytime you have a square root that's not a perfect square, if you were to convert it to a decimal, okay, those decimals would go on for forever and they don't repeat. Okay, now rational numbers are broken down into even more categories, so we need to go over those. So the next big category of a rational number are integers. So integers are all positive and negative numbers that do not contain fractions or decimals. Now, technically they're not necessarily a whole number, but I called it whole because you don't have a fraction or a decimal. It also will include zero. So it's all the negatives, all the positives, and zero. And you don't have fractions or decimals. So like negative 2, negative 120, 0, 5, and 179. And guys, the reason why I have these arrows, if something is an integer, that means it's rational, it can be represented as a fraction, and it also means it's real. So like if you follow this little flow chart upward, you will know that an integer is also rational and it's also real. So pretty cool. Okay, a whole number, which we're about to talk about, will be an integer, a rational number, and also a real number. So Basically, some of these numbers technically fall into more than one category. Okay, so a whole number. These are non-negative integers and include zero. So, non-negative integers, remember, integers don't contain decimals. 
Okay, so it's not negative, so all the positives, including zero, that don't have any decimals. Okay, so that means it's a category of an integer, because it's a non-negative integer. And since integers are rational, it's also rational. And since rationals are real, it's also real. So whole numbers are also integers, rational, and real numbers. Holy hot dog, right? I know. Okay, and the last type of rational number we need to talk about is a natural number which a natural number is going to be all of the positive whole numbers. So it's a set of the whole numbers. It's a subset. Okay? It does not include zero, though. So it's basically like you take all the whole numbers and then chop off zero, and bam, you have natural numbers. Okay, so a natural number is a whole number because it doesn't have any decimals. It's also an integer because it still doesn't have a decimal. Okay? Um, and it's also a whole number because it's not negative. Um, it's also rational because it's not a decimal. Um, I'm sorry. It's also rational because it can be represented as a fraction. Sorry, guys. My brain's all over the place. And then also it's a real number. So a natural number, it's a whole number, an integer, a rational number, and a real number. Okay, so if you just follow this up the flow chart, you will see all the categories of numbers that each of these apply to. Okay? So these are all the categories of real numbers. Now, we need to talk about a number that is not a real number, which you're probably like, um, what are you talking about, Miss Long? Well, let's talk about it. Let's say I really want to know what x is. I need to square a number, and I need to get negative 9. So what can you multiply to itself to get negative 9? Hmm. What is the same exact number that you can multiply it to itself to get negative 9? Hmm. Well, the only number that multiplies me 9 is 3 and 3. So, 3 times 3 is positive 9. And negative 3 times negative 3 is also positive 9. If you're squaring a number, those two numbers have to be the same. The only thing that will multiply to be negative 9 is like a negative 3 and a positive 3. Which then that means you're not squaring the number anymore because you have to have the same exact number. So 3 times 3 is 9. Negative 3 times negative 3 is also positive 9. <gasps> so if you guys see here, you cannot square a number and get a negative. It cannot happen. It does not exist in the real world. But these kinds of numbers will exist in something called the complex number system or the imaginary world. Okay, so if you ever end up, if you're trying to square a number and you're going to get a negative, that is when an imaginary number will come into play or a complex number. Okay, so technically all numbers are classified as a complex number, which a complex number is when you have a real an imaginary component. So if you have a real number and an imaginary number combined, that is called a complex number, which a complex number we're going to represent with an I, or, or an imaginary number really. Um, an imaginary number we represent with an I. So if you see an I with a number, that means it's imaginary. So I have a real number because it doesn't have an I, 4, and an imaginary number because it has an I. So 4 plus 3I. So, complex numbers have a real component and an imaginary component, okay? And then a subset, so a subset of the complex numbers are technically real numbers, and the other subset of the complex numbers are the imaginary numbers, which those are only numbers that contain i. So, if you have a number without an i, it's not an imaginary. So, let's talk about that more in detail. So, oh, I have a board slapper, though. So... The i is telling the pi to be rational because pi is an irrational number. And the pi is telling the imaginary number to get real because it's not real. It's imaginary. Get it? Oh, man. I'm going to throw a lot of board slappers at you guys, so just prepare yourself. Okay, so getting back to a complex number. So a complex number has a real part and an imaginary part. So it has something without an i, the real part and something with an i, which is the imaginary part. So when b is 0, 0 times anything is 0. 
So if you have a real number plus, plus zero, it's going to stay real. So when B is zero, you have only an, a real number. Okay? When A is zero, so if, if you have zero plus something with an I, you're only left with something with an I. So when A is zero, the number is something called a pure imaginary number. So complex numbers have real and imaginary numbers, but if either of these parts is zero, then it's either only a real number or only an imaginary number. Okay, so if you go back to the chart, all numbers are complex, and complex is broken down into all types of real numbers, as well as just pure imaginary numbers. Okay, I think I have another board slap before you. So the square root says, why can't we be together? And the negative one says it's complex because imaginary numbers are complex numbers. Get it? Oh, man. That was awesome. Uh, but anyway, so we're going to solve, we're going to talk about how to solve a square root with a negative. Okay, which if you ever have a negative underneath a square root, that means you're going to have an imaginary number. Okay, so this is going to turn into an imaginary number. So we're going to talk about how to simplify square roots with negatives, which just means we're going to talk about how to solve an imaginary expression. Okay, and then we're also, so I, we're going to represent all imaginary numbers with the letter I. This is like a fancy cursive I. I is going to equal the square root of negative 1. So if you ever have a negative underneath your radical, an I is going to appear because it represents an imaginary number. Okay, and then here's another board slapper. So it says all cute, he has an imaginary friend, and you know, because it's a square root of negative 1, which is imaginary, get it? <laughs> board slapper. Oh man. Okay, so anyways, we're going to talk about how to solve with these square roots in example 8 and 9 when there's a negative number underneath the square root. So now that we know all that, now we can actually solve these. So we're going to get started on example 8 right now. Okay, let's see. Okay, so we're going to be simplifying imaginary numbers, which you always know you have an imaginary number when there is a negative sign underneath the square root because you cannot multiply a, any number to itself to get a negative number. So that is kind of the hint that an I is going to appear. Okay, so let's get started, you guys. So I'm going to kind of show you what the square root means. And then I'm going to show you a shortcut for how to solve. Okay, so technically, you guys, I could break down the square root into negative 1 times 9. Okay, so negative 9 equals negative 1 times 9, which I'm going to focus this because it doesn't look very focused right now. Okay, it's a little bit better, I guess. Okay. Now, just like the quotient property, if you ever have two numbers multiplying under a square root, you can break it apart into two separate radicals. Okay, so the square root of negative 1 times 9 is equal to the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 9. So if you are dividing under a square root or have a fraction, you can break it apart into two separate square roots. Also, if you are multiplying under a square root, you can also break it apart into two separate square roots. But it stops there. You guys can't do this with addition or subtraction. So just be careful. The demon cats are always lurking. So watch yourself. Okay, now we know that the square root of negative 1, that is when you have an imaginary number. And that is actually going to mean i. The square root of negative 1 is i. Okay, and then we know the square root of 9. What times what gives you 9? Well, that would be 3. So the square root of 9 is 3. So I have an i and a 3, or i times 3. Now, technically, for your final answer, you guys, it does not matter the order that you write multiplication. So you could write your answer as i3 or 3i. Honestly, it doesn't matter, but I'm going to tell you, i is not a variable okay i is the square root of negative one variables are numbers that change 
i is always the square root of negative one so it's not a variable but when you guys do math with i or when you manipulate the i and do different operations with the i like add subtract multiply divide you kind of treat it like it is a variable so usually like if the i would have been an x okay you usually wouldn't write like x3 you would write 3x okay so it's not wrong to write i3 I'm just telling you right now that mathematicians are going to judge you. Typically, we write the i second. Okay, so the square root of negative 9 is 3i because negative 9 breaks down into negative 1 and 9. We know the square root of negative 1 is i, and we know the square root of 9 is 3. So this is 3i. Okay, so just in case you don't want to have to go through all that, I got a shortcut for you, which I'm going to show you down here. So I'm going to work it out again, but I'm going to show you the shortcut. Okay? So basically, you guys, if you see a negative under a square root, the way that you can transform that number to a positive is to have i hop out of your square root. Okay, so if I have i hop outside the square root, my negative 9 will transform into a positive 9. Okay, so negative signs means that i is going to hop out, and that will transform into a positive. So we have i root 9. Okay, and then the square root of 9 is 3. So this is simply 3i, because the square root of 9 is 3, and you have the i. Okay, so that's the shortcut. So if you don't want to have to like go through all this, just know if you have a negative underneath the square root, the i hops out, it changes to a positive number, and then you just square root the number like you would any other square root problem. Okay, so that's it with example 8. Example 9 is going to be very similar, except in this one, it will not be a perfect square, which means we're going to have to use the factor tree. So let's get going.